ideal places for catching flu are trams and buses. People who have escaped so far can read the health minister's hints on how to avoid it altogether. Hospitals in Tokyo are filled with the stricken children. The epidemic is causing concern to health authorities around the world. AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. No one with AIDS has been cured. AIDS is now the leading cause of death among young people in this country. Since November, almost 8,500 people around the world have come down with SARS. The disease spreads to more than 30 countries. Now H1N1 has spread so far. It all began in Mexico, where the virus has claimed more than 100 lives. Many hospitals in West Africa are basic and overstretched. Half of nurses or doctors infected with Ebola there are dying. The Zika virus, Boston reporting its first case of the disease, now more than 30 cases detected here in the U.S. And take a look at this map. Hong Kong health authorities have activated their most serious response level after an outbreak of a new type of viral pneumonia in China. The World Health Organization just de de declared this a global health emergency. Tonight, mixed messages on the threat of coronavirus, with one of the most public faces of President Trump's task force warning that the most difficult days may be ahead. Across the country, the demand on health care providers is surging. We have a problem right now. There is a virus that is continuing to spread and spread more rapidly than I think anyone predicted given what we could have done to try and control this. It's, it's spiraling out of control. Thank you for joining us today for the 2021 Director's Lecture at the University of Michigan's Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. I'm Dr. John Ianyan, Director of the Institute and the Alice Hamilton Professor of Medicine and Healthcare Policy here at the University of Michigan. For those joining us today who are not familiar with our Institute, HPI is the nation's largest university-based organization of researchers focused on health policies to improve healthcare and health. This month, we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of HPI's founding by the University's Board of Regents in May, 2011. Over the past 10 years, HPI has grown to include more than 670 faculty members across the University of Michigan's three campuses and 15 of its schools and colleges. Our faculty and students from diverse fields collaborate to help solve major health challenges, such as the quality and safety of healthcare, healthy aging, the opioid epidemic, health disparities, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Since HPI's founding, we have welcomed many respected policymakers, journalists, and health professionals to share their experiences and insights with our University of Michigan community through the annual director's lecture and other events. I'm very pleased to welcome back today's special guest, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. In 2018, Dr. Gupta and his wife, Rebecca, co-hosted HPI's Gupta Family Hackathon for Health Communication, which brought together an energized group of 120 students to design new tools to improve how health information is shared. In 2017, HPI and the University Center for the History of Medicine co-sponsored a major conference featuring Dr. Gupta, along with Anthony Fauci, Paul Farmer, and other experts discussing the risks of global pandemics three years before COVID-19 came to dominate our lives. Today's conversation with Dr. Gupta will be moderated by my colleague, Dr. Preeti Malani. Dr. Malani is the university's chief health officer and a professor of internal medicine and infectious disease specialist at the medical school. She's also director of the National Poll on Healthy Aging that is based at IHPI and co-sponsored by AARP. Prior to medical school, Dr. Malani completed her master's in journalism at Northwestern University and worked as a reporter for the Dayton Daily News in Ohio. I expect you will find today's conversation between Dr. Gupta and Dr. Milani enlightening and engaging. If you would like to submit a question for Dr. Gupta, please email it to ihpievents at umich.edu. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Preeti Milani to introduce Dr. Sanjay Gupta and their discussion this Thank you, John. You know, there's an expression that someone is so well known that they need no introduction. And while this description is often hyperbole, our guest today truly needs no introduction. We all know Dr. Sanjay Gupta as the Emmy award-winning chief medical correspondent for CNN. 
a constant presence during the pandemic and trusted voice who's helped all of us navigate COVID-19. This is a role that Sanjay has honed and perfected during his 20 years at CNN, previously covering H1N1, Ebola, countless humanitarian crises, and sharing the stories of everyday people all over the world. Sanjay has always thought about health broadly, encouraging all of us to take better care of our minds and bodies. He's written multiple books on these topics, including his current bestseller, Keep Sharp. Something you may not know is that Sanjay may, remains clinically active as a practicing neurosurgeon, and two years ago, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. In addition, Sanjay is a dedicated girl dad, husband, son, brother, pet parent, and friend to many. He is a Michigan man to his core, born and raised in the Detroit area, and completing his undergraduate and medical degrees at the University of Michigan prior to doing his neurosurgery residency here as well. One of the silver linings to the pandemic for me has been the opportunity to catch up with Sanjay frequently, sometimes through cryptic text exchanged at odd hours, sometimes by phone. And I had the honor of joining him last summer to record a podcast titled, When Can I See My Grandkids? Much to the delight of grandparents everywhere. Now, before starting our conversation, I wanted to quickly share a photo that is perhaps the first time Sanjay and I got to share a stage. And uh, if I can <laughs> get the photo, uh, this is a picture from 1987 taken at Mosher Jordan Hall. And you know, Sanjay, I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, but I'm quite certain it wasn't a global pandemic. I don't it's think it was pleasure. fashion Welcome. either based on those, uh, those <laughs> clothes. <laughs> I know you need like a John Hughes film uh, score right in the background. But anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome my dear friend, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Preeti, thank you very much. And I'm glad you, you mentioned at the end that out of all those things, you, you mentioned uh, 34 years of friendship with, with you is, is, a, is a real highlight for me as well. So what a privilege and an honor to be here. Thank you. Great. Uh, so Sanjay, this past year, it's been all COVID all the time you know, for you and actually for me as well. Uh, to get our conversation started, I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit about your experience during this extraordinary time as a journalist and as a physician. You know, it's it's been um, uh, so immersive, you know, this, this these last 14, 15 months. I mean, everyone talks about the fact that time feels warped and, you know, this, this year in some ways has felt like a decade, all of that. Um, I think for, for me personally, I, since you know January of last year, really felt like I have um, been sprinting, you know, and learning as much as I can about this virus. Uh, you're waking up early so you can speak to people on the other side of the world. Uh, it, we're in a pandemic, so understanding their perspectives on things on a daily basis. And really, you know, just just trying to trying to be almost get a master's degree or a PhD in something very very quickly. You know, you're just constantly learning. Frankly, learning way more than I guess you would say you would need to learn to be a journalist. I can report on these facts, but you know, this became something that uh, was almost an obsession. I think in some ways, um, immersing myself fully in this. The physician role was is interesting because you, you remember in the spring of last year. Um, I'm practicing in, in the, within the Emory system, but essentially the hospitals went into almost full COVID mode. So we weren't really doing any elective operations for about, about two months, almost seven weeks. And, and uh, strangely, I got a little bit of a break because that would normally be you know, a significant amount of time. And I was so busy covering the COVID pandemic. So uh, those two things, at least for a period of time, gave me, gave me a break. But it's just been it's been really immersive, and I guess that's the nature of a pandemic. You don't you don't ever really get a break from it. What what's been the most surprising thing about your experience covering the pandemic? Um, you know, there's you're constantly learning. I mean, obviously, but I think that the two more non intuitive things I would say that um, came about one is you know something that I think you and I've talked about. A lot of people talk about is just the concept of risk overall and how people really interpret and assess their own risk. And I think the thing that strikes me, and I guess maybe it's obvious, is like you can give people objective data about risk. You can say something is, you know, I'm making up the numbers, but 0.5% lethal, whatever it may be. And that's the objective data, and people will subjectively interpret that in very different ways. There'll be a group of people who say 0.5%, that's 
So one in 200 people are going to die. I mean, we better be very careful. We better, you know, be protected, do all those things. Other people may say, so you're saying I'm 99.5% good, right? It's the same data. And, and I'm really not saying that in a way to malign one group or the other. I think it really does depend from where you come. I mean, if you're already somebody who lives a high risk lifestyle because you're an essential worker or frontline worker, whatever, you may err towards the 99.5% good side of the equation. Whereas, you know, if you think about your ability to work from home or, or you know, caring for your family, whatever it may be, 0.5% seems like too much. So that was a insight, you know, um, a reminder, I think, uh, more than a surprise. The other thing I'll say, and I think, I think you'll appreciate this, uh, Preeti, is that, you know, we call this a novel coronavirus, right? And so people understand coronavirus. I think sometimes the word novel is sort of glossed over. And I really, I really think this is interesting beyond just the pandemic, that this is new. It's a new thing. And it's very hard, I think, especially as an adult, um, as opposed to a child, but an adult who has experiences and maybe even somebody who's very knowledgeable in a particular area. It's very difficult, I think, sometimes to let go of preconceived notions and treat something as truly novel, tabula rosa. I mean, obviously, there's some similarities. It's a coronavirus or certain things we know. But I think there, were, there was this tendency initially, coronavirus from China, that's SARS. I'll put that in the SARS box. That's how that's going to behave. Uh, pandemic potential, that's H1N1. I'll put that in the H1N1 box. This is how it's going to behave. And that could get in your way. So the idea of really, I mean, as an adult, when is the last time you experienced something for the first time? You know, kids do it all the time. You know, I watch my kids and it's like, oh my goodness, that's a wondrous new thing. I never experienced that before. Adults don't have that. And we want to contextualize everything, which is totally understandable. It's part of having experience and judgment. But when something is truly novel, that can sometimes get in the way. So those are those are two, I guess, more insights, personal insights and surprises. But, you know, I've, I've thought about it a lot. Yeah, I, I, I really like both points. And I think the risk issue is something that we have talked about and you know, especially a year ago where we really didn't know the risk of a lot of things like getting back to school, getting back to work. And, you know, some days the risk felt manageable and other days it really felt unmanageable. And I, I think we do have a, a better sense of that. But I, I like the way you, uh, you, you put, give context to the novelty issue, too. Yeah. So, Sanjay, you know, the public looks to you as one of the most trusted sources of health information. And, of course, this is especially true about covid as a journalist, what qualities do you look for in a source? I think, you know, um, th there's the obvious qualities in terms of, uh, you know, their, their subject matter expertise, their overall profile, fund of knowledge in a, in a particular area, all the things that, you know, you think of whether you're looking at an academic setting or from a, from a reporting standpoint, you know, we really want to vet our, our sources, I think. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the big things as well, which is always the case, but to the extent that you can show someone is, is devoid of, of conflict, I think is really important. And again, maybe obvious, but I think a lot of times when this is said, it is, it is uh, said in a way that to, to sort of insinuate that the person knowingly is conflicted. I think a lot of times people may not even know that they're really conflicted and, and that can be more difficult to parse out. Um, it's not that they're trying to even they're not trying to knowingly give you bad information based on that conflict, but I think it does. Um, it, it is something you have to look for, and I think it can it can diminish the credibility of the reporting in the public's eye if someone does have a conflict, even if it didn't necessarily affect the integrity of the of the subject matter. So I think that that would be perhaps the most um, one of the most surprising things. But other than that, you know, I think for a source for just getting knowledge and information and learning from, you really want that that obviously subject matter expertise and somebody who's had uh, an ability to integrate all the novel knowledge that's coming into to this equation. So I'm gonna ask a related question and it's, it has to do with social media. And again, these questions, a lot of these questions came in uh, during the last few weeks as we were advertising for this event. So these are some things that our, our uh, colleagues are really interested in your, in your, sure. in your view on. So with social media, as you know, a lot of researchers, clinicians, and scientists have really taken to Twitter and other platforms to communicate about either their own work or the, react to the work of others. And 
you know, Twitter has actually verified a lot of them with the blue check. Mm-hmm. And what um, what role does a experts or a source in your case uh, presence on social media play? And in a, to ask it another way, in the current mm-hmm. social media ecosystem, is there a risk of a bias favoring those uh, sources or scientists that are more social media savvy experts versus people who are really more knowledgeable? Sure. Well. I think the answer to the question is yes, to be to be candid. There's a little, I mean, if for no other reason, the people who are out there on social media, I mean, if you're people who are producing television shows, news shows, and you're looking for, for different sources, I mean, that is a place that people go. Um, a lot of times, if you're trying to find the first author of a paper that's recently come out, uh, it, is a, it is a process by which you go to the university, you get approvals and all that, which is understandable. But if someone is out on social media, they're basically saying, hey, you know, I've I'm talking about this. I'm authorized to talk about this. Whatever you know, I'm, I have this this desire to get this information out there. It doesn't mean you still don't go through the vetting process, you know, and and all the things that we talked about earlier. But I, you know, I think that it's it's not necessarily the case. I think Preeti that because someone has a social media profile and is a robust one, that they're less knowledgeable. I mean, we have people who who have who are very knowledgeable. I mean, um, Rochelle Walensky, who's now the CDC director. She was a CNN contributor before she became CDC director. And one of the ways that I think, I, I really have nothing to do with the process, but the way it's been described to me uh, is that they, they, you know, she was um, in her role at, at Brigham, putting a lot out on social media about, you know, some of the thoughts about the virus uh, initially. This is back in the spring of last year. So I think it can be helpful. I think it can be helpful. I mean, it, you know, we are at this sort of inflection point, I think, in terms of how people are gathering knowledge in the history of our of our world and a lot of people are getting this information on social media it's important for us i think as a television network to ensure the veracity of that to do our homework to do the checking you know but essentially these are people who are flagging to us hey i'm i i have this background i want to talk about this i think this is an issue i'm raising a flag and putting it on social media um and sometimes that 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 certainly gets our attention so we got a lot of questions on medical misinformation and distrust in, in science. And I know this is something that you, you know, you think about and talk about a lot. Maybe we can dig into these issues a bit. Uh, what can both healthcare professionals and the media do to combat the rampant medical misinformation and, and really more general distrust in science that is out there? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, that's, it's a really difficult um issue, you know, I think in some ways, and uh, you asked me about surprises earlier, this, I guess, maybe qualifies as another sort of surprise to some extent. Um, I think that the idea of having, you know, data, evidence, facts, uh, as your currency, uh, as a science reporter, has always been, you know, I think, been the case and very important, and I thought would be enough, you know, to present that. But it, it can get sometimes um, uh, commingled with, with stuff that is bad information or feels overly political or, or whatever the case may be. I think that the, the, the surprise to me, and Dr. Fauci actually was the one who, who shared this with me, uh, it was a survey that he read that he said that scientists and, and doctors have increasingly been perceived as arrogant, which I thought was a, a really um, interesting point. Sorry. Um, I have a, somebody's calling on, on, is that your device or is that? No, Sorry. it's not mine. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I just got this thing, came across my, I still can't get my, my Zoom thing. I apologize. I don't, my phone is over here. So I don't know why that's ringing. Apologies. Um, but I think that the idea that, that scientists or, or health experts, public health experts can seem too didactic in, in how they're presenting information, especially given that we were all dealing with something that was novel and we were we were learning together about this we didn't know everything in the beginning so how didactic will you be in a situation where um knowledge is still emerging and changing even and i think that that was um, sort of an important point so what do i do i mean i i don't i don't pretend that i have the absolute answer here but i do think <laughs> letting people in on the process becomes really helpful not in a way where you're trying to like recite algebra textbooks to them. But I don't know the answer here, but let me tell you how I'm thinking about this. Here's why when we saw nine clusters in Wuhan initially of three people each, that that was enough evidence of human to human transmission. That was when that that 
evidence was sort of there. That's how it was sort of coming out. It, it hit the bar for that. Or, or why we didn't come right out and say that vaccines prevent asymptomatic infection initially, because here's how a clinical trial works, right? Here's what they were looking for. Here's what they found. So I do find that letting people in on the process can be helpful towards combating misinformation um, and making it part of the story almost. Let me tell you the story of the scientists and how they collected this information. We got this documentary called Race for the Vaccine coming out next weekend, basically shot on five continents where we wanted the scientists who are behind all these various vaccine platforms to explain it. And also explain their, you know, if they had any concerns about adverse effects and overall efficacy and all that. And sometimes that helps. There's about 18, 20% of the country that I think always will be science skeptical. It's held up for the 20 years that I've been here. But I think there's a, there's a large movable middle in there as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, a lot of that, that, that resonates with me. And yeah, I think one of the most difficult things has been that change from the morning to the evening, they change. And Thankfully, now we're in a, a state where things aren't changing quite as much. But a year ago, what we said one day was different another. And I think that certainly adds to the, that skepticism. But, you know, just as a related question, even when if you communicate evidence based messages well, which you do, we still need to convince people to act and behave in ways that protect public health. And I think that's been difficult uh, during the pandemic. Uh, how, how should we do that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it is. And I think this does get back to the to the um, the basic question of not only the message, but the messenger to some extent. And and the messenger, not necessarily someone who's necessarily uh, articulate, which is important, but but more trusted. And and I think, you know, we have gotten to a point, I think, in our society, Preeti, where I do ask myself often, who are the honest brokers in our society? Like, like if you if you look back through history and you think, you know, just as a human species, there were times in our history where there were people who we just absolutely trusted, right? It, maybe at times it was from religious organizations, the clergy. And other times I know the, the military was the most trusted entity in the country. Other times it was small business owners. All these doctors, uh, healthcare professionals are often among the most trusted uh, people. But I think uh, part of it is like, does the person have some sort of conflict? You know, if they feel like you, there's a conflict, I think that makes it challenging. I'm biased in the sense that I think that journalists are pretty good, honest brokers. I mean, it's not always perceived as such. I'm not so naive as to, to think that it that it's um, just always going to be perceived uh, neutral. But I got no conflict in this. And I when I then tell you that I talked to all the vaccine makers since January 10th when the sequence first came out. I apologize. Do you hear this noise? I'm, yeah, but it's okay. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. I, 14, 15 months, and I still can't figure out the technology. <laughs> but um, but I, I think that when I then say, I, I am so sorry. I, I This is driving me insane. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't, I can't believe this. I have no idea there's a phone somewhere. Like my phone's over here. It's just like Laurel and the Hardy routine. My girls like are probably punking me. Possessed. So, <laughs> I, I feel like if you've been on a plane and then I'm trying to think and then you hear the airplane announcement, you must store your bins in the overhead bin. I feel like that's what I'm experiencing right now. So, um, But when I then say, you know, I've looked at all this data, I've talked to the vaccine makers. There you go. It's been said yeah. goodbye. The, goodbye. The, when, when, I then, when I then say I've been talking to the vaccine makers since January 10th, I've looked at all the data, the safety data, all of this. And at the end of the day, I decided to get vaccinated. Uh, I recommended that my, my wife get vaccinated. My kids are all between the ages of 12 and 15, and they'll likely have an authorized vaccine very soon, imminently. And they want to get vaccinated. My parents, who are both in their 70s, late 70s, got vaccinated. So, you know, just, just saying, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the conversation you may often have with your patients, Preeti, where you go and you tell them what's happening and then you lay out options. And at the end of the visit, it's always some version of what would you do if it were you, or if, if I were your mother, what would you recommend? And what the, and I think it's a fair question. I think what they're really asking you is, okay, you've shown me all the data, but now with all the subjective things and all the micro decisions that you make when you put it all together, were you me, uh, what would you do? And, and I think conveying that is, is important uh, a little bit. Obviously you can't do it for everything, but the vaccines, 
uh, for vaccine hesitancy, for example, that was an, uh, a way that we could present this this knowledge. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think you're you're absolutely right, and and I I do use that kind of messaging many times because in infectious disease often there's not a, an easy answer, and and you lay it out and you say if this was my family member, you know, this is what I would recommend, and and it might change, and and uh, I think that that is uh, difficult. You know, again, this is a related point with the public health messaging. Some people have criticized the messaging as being viewed as negative, you know, and this has certainly been true with masks, like this idea that if you don't wear a mask, you're going to get sick and you're a bad person. And, you know, what value can sort of a positive reinforcement have? And and I think particularly in, in terms of incentivizing vaccination, we were talking right before we got started that, that in Georgia, for example, uptake has been poor and Michigan, it's, it's been okay, but it, it might be stalling a bit. Hmm. So what can we do to sort of bring a, a more positive view on this? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right, first of all. And, you know, I mean, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of parallels between being a medical clinician, taking care of patients and and being a medical reporter and talking about these issues more broadly in this regard. You know, you, you think about how you're dealing with patients, you know, um, I think. I think honesty has to be, you know, the most important ingredient. I mean, you don't want to sugarcoat things or, or uh, somehow try and gloss over things in an effort to, to, to not be as honest or forthright or transparent as possible about the gravity of the problem. But I don't think it also is a necessary thing that to take away from from hope. You know, I, I, I think people say, well, I don't want to give bad news because I want to panic. Well, you have to be honest, but not panicking means presenting a problem with the plan. Okay, I've here's the issue here, but what I've been doing is my homework and, and thinking about this and all these things, and here, here are various potential plans. So I think you have to sort of present uh, the, the two of those things together, but never, you don't have to be, you don't be overly dire, but I don't think you should ever pull punches either in terms of just being really honest. So there's no misunderstanding of the gravity necessarily of a situation. And it's hard. It's hard if you're a doc, it's hard if you're a dad, you know, I mean, in, in your life, it's hard to, to be that, but you, but you have to do it. It's, it's important. The other thing, Preeti, I'll just tell you on a more subjective note, I, I um, thought a lot about Maya Angelou's famous quote where she says some version of, of people may not always remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I think, I think, you know, again, whether it's your own family, whether it's your patients, whether it's on television, there is a subjective quality to this uh, in the sense that, you know, panic and, 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 and making things overly dire it can be your words, but also your, your body language and, you know, your, your nonverbals as well. I had this long conversation. Um, you, you remember Dr. Hoff, I, I, oh, yes. he was my chairman at Michigan. Um, just a wonderful guy. And, and one of these guys who I, I remember thinking about him, he always had a slight smile on his face, no matter what. He, he never saw him without a slight smile on his face. And I just, that's how, and he would be in a patient's room sometimes, and it would be tough information he was giving the patient about what was going on. And he still, still had the smile. I remember thinking at that age, is that is that minimizing the problem to be having a little bit of a smile? I mean, is it is it seeming like you're not taking it seriously, which obviously wasn't the case for him. But what I realized watching him was that it was he was absolutely taking it seriously, but there was an openness about him. It wasn't didactic. It wasn't too clinical. The smile wasn't minimizing something. It was saying, I'm open. I'm, I'm empathetic. I'm, I'm here with you, not not talking down at you, you know, so I think uh, I think all those things become really important when trying to to convey, you know, what what may be bad information. I will say that the vaccine, just real quick, as much as we know that it will save people's lives, it's very protective. I think an important part of that message has to be, OK, now what do you get to do with that life? It's been saved, essentially. Uh, now you know, if I don't get to do anything differently with that life, then that's the positive thing that I think maybe you're, you're, you're alluding to. You want to couple it with, with positive messages like that. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thanks for bringing up a great memory of uh, the wonderful Dr. Hoff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that makes me smile. Uh, yeah. And I think that that positive messaging is something that we're talking a lot about on campus too. And just that not, not only, you know, are you going to be safer and everyone around you is safer, but You'll also not need to be tested. You'll not need to go to quarantine, things like that. So 
Uh, and speaking of vaccination, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, especially early on, on improving uptake in communities where there was concern about hesitance. And you know, it turns out these communities are really quite diverse. They're urban, they're rural, they're young people, and there are different reasons for hesitancy. Can you talk about the role that communication plays in informing the public effectively? Is it, you know, are we at the point where basically people have made a decision and they're going to stick with it? Yeah, I mean, th this is a this is a, a subject of a lot of a lot of polling, and as you well know, Preeti, this is not uh, a totally new issue. I mean, this is uh, you know we saw significant vaccine hesitancy around H1N1 back in 2009. I mean, significant, greater than 50% uh, hesitancy or, or low vaccine confidence, depending on how, you know, which questionnaire you were looking at. So it's, it's not a new issue. Um, what they found back then, which I think is really interesting uh, now, is that when you ultimately looked at what did make the biggest difference in people who were sort of in the movable middle, I think there's about 18% of people roughly who basically will not, um, you know, say they absolutely will not get a vaccine or they can't be convinced. I can't remember the exact wording, but it's, you know, around 18% that sort of fall into a very transient sort of group. But for the movable middle, which is probably closer to, you know, 20% it itself, um, it was their local healthcare providers that far and away made the biggest difference in whether or not they would ultimately get it. It wasn't reporters, as much as I'd like to believe that it, it might have an impact. It wasn't celebrities. It wasn't politicians. It wasn't large PSA campaigns. They went through this polling. And recently, they've done some, some updated polling now, you know, 12 years later. And, and that sentiment remains the same. There's lots of things we want to hear from certain populations, celebrities and, and politicians about. But on this issue of, you know, vaccination, or you know some something that you're putting into your body, I guess whatever it may be, it is the communication and interaction with their local healthcare teams. So if you had to spend resources as a country trying to address vaccine hesitancy, the vast majority of it should be to make sure there's not significant vaccine hesitancy among healthcare workers, because there is. You know even among healthcare workers, it's somewhat reflective of the country. Now healthcare workers is a broad, diverse group of people, but there is vaccine hesitancy there as well. But if you can address that. That is a good way then to make sure you have these ambassadors of, of good knowledge and information to combat vaccine hesitancy. Yeah, no, and in fact, our work with the National Poll on Healthy Aging, we, we found that as well, like more than half of respondents, and this was 50 to 80 year olds, and this was done before the vaccine was even available. We, we polled in October, said that the recommendation of their doctor would really matter a lot to them. And I know that my friends who do primary care are really busy having important okay. conversations with people. So, you know, Sanjay, putting aside your, your uh, journalist hat as a uh, physician, as a public health professional, if you had 30 seconds to convince someone to get the COVID-19 vaccine, what would you say? I would say that I've, for the last 14 months, really since this whole process began, uh, as a journalist, um, I've been studying it as a health reporter, scientific journalist studying the whole process, talked to the vaccine makers, watched the clinical trials unfold, looked at the data very early on, watched the FDA advisory committee process, saw the CDC uh, uh, committees sort of make their deliberations on the vaccine. And at the end of the day, when I put it all together in the millions of micro decisions that go through all of our minds on a, on a daily basis, I got vaccinated. I told my kids they should get vaccinated. My wife who deals with chronic disease got vaccinated and my parents are in their late seventies and worried about this virus got vaccinated and we all got it and we're all doing great and living these lives that I think are improved and less, less uh, anxiety ridden as a result. That's what I would say. And it, it again, it kind of like we were talking about before, it encompasses uh, the homework, you know, the knowledge. I, I, it, it is one of those things that I did myself, you know, I mean, you can't always say that with medical things that I've gone through this, but in this case you can. And I think it's okay to, to remind people of that. That's great. So speaking of your family, you live in a house with a lot of girl power. <laughs> yes. You're, uh, you know, and since, you know, Bosco was like the only dude there besides you for a long time, uh, but your amazing wife, Rebecca, your three daughters, but you also have a remarkable mother, uh, mm -hmm. Dementi Gupta, who has broken many barriers and, and inspired all of us, including myself. And, you know, I knew part of uh, the Manthianti's story 
but I learned a lot more when I read her reflection in Time Magazine a few years ago, and we'll make sure to share that link via Twitter. But the quick version is that her family escaped violence during partition. She lived as a refugee, later was inspired by uh, Prime Minister Nehru to help build India. And she decided to become an engineer. And in fact, she went to school with a bunch of boys, but once they realized she wasn't living, leaving, uh, they actually built a girl's bathroom for her. <laughs> and I'm just gonna read a uh, part of the essay. The first time I applied to Ford, I wasn't hired, but I didn't give up. When I tried again a few months later, the HR person was confused. He looked at my resume and said, you're applying for an engineering job. We have no females here. I told him, I'm here. And unless you hire me, you'll never have any. <laughs> so she went on to become the first woman with a master's in engineering ever to be hired by Ford Motor Company. I can, I can just picture her actually saying that. And you know, my question, Sanjay, is just how your mom influenced you and, and your brother Sunil's career. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Preeti. I mean, she she is a, uh, as you know, a huge fan of yours as well. She'd be delighted to know that you just read that uh, at this forum, and I'm gonna definitely tell her. Um, I mean, she's been, you know, so 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 uh, su such an influence in, in so many ways. I mean, just representative of who she who she is and what she overcame. I mean, it, it wasn't something she wore on her sleeves and constantly reminded us of. I was a refugee until I was 14 years old. She, I don't think she hardly ever did it. I mean, we, we still learn things about her life now that, you know, Sunil and I are both, you know, adults and we have these conversations with her, which she still shares things that are brand new. Um, but I think, you know, there, there's no question um, for my mom. And I think, you know, frankly, to be, to be honest, a lot of people who, whose parents are immigrants, you know, I mean, the, there, there was this, um, this belief that like in our household saying the word can't wasn't something that we, that word wasn't used a lot you know can't excuse me you know what do you mean you can't you know i i do you know what i've done here you know and 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 i think there was also a desire to you know our parents because they had sacrificed so much to make sure that um we weren't running in place you didn't just put us here to run in place for our short time here on this earth you did all this stuff so that we could you know, just sprint. It didn't matter where we sprinted, what we did when we got there, just just do something, enjoy this blessing of life. And and we are trying to make it as good for you as possible. So I think that was that was a big, big part of her her impact on on us as well. I mean it's very as you might imagine, it's challenging having a mom like that in some ways. She's demanding. You know, <laughs> she is she she expects a lot, but you you certainly um you, you want to deliver. And I think Sunil would say the same thing. I mean I think that's Sunil's 10 years younger than I am, but we, we in some ways had that same experience because of her. Yeah, and I'm sure the, uh, the, the five uh, granddaughters have a lot to say about their daddy also. No, it's, it, it's really amazing. And it's the same sort of thing. They learn things about her and they're like, wait, daddy did that? You know, that was daddy's life. You know, they read the Time Magazine profile on her and it was, it was kind of amazing. I'll tell you, you may know, I don't even know if this was in the article, but when she started at Ford, because they hired her, you know, after that whole thing, and this is the mid sixties and she's wearing a sari and it's winter outside and just to paint the picture for you. And she's literally cold calling, you know, offices in Dearborn, Michigan. They eventually she gets hired and they say to her, the person who's hiring her. So your name is, and, and he can't say it. Damienti, you can't say it. He's like, you're going to have to have a nickname. You know, we can't, I can't possibly say this name and sort of, she thinks about it for a second and then says, Nickname's Ronnie. And Ronnie, as you know, Preeti, means queen in Hindi, which was just this, I mean, that's another great example of my mom who basically said, okay, you're gonna make me change my name? Well, then you will call me queen for the rest of my professional career, which I, you know, that that story kind of encapsulates her, I think more than anything. Yeah, it's a, it's a great story. I hope people will, will read that. It's a wonderful reflection. <laughs> so speaking of which, you know, advice, uh, some of our, students and recent graduates and, and health professionals, they would like your advice on how they might venture into medical journalism. Well, I, I think I think it's a really um, growing area. You know, when I got into medical journalism, um, there weren't a lot, there weren't a lot of people doing it. I mean, th there was and not, not that many on television. There were more sort of in, in newspapers and magazines, but it was starting to grow. And this is 20 years ago. I just, I just, celebrated my 20 years, which I can't even believe. I mean, 20 years, like it's like, you, you know, this job has been like having a child one day and the next day you turn around, they're going to college. That's what this job has felt like. It's gone by so quickly. But 
it's it's um there, there's a lot more desire thirst for this kind of knowledge. I mean, certainly you know during times of pandemic, but I think overall there it is a it's a really growing field with lots of different platforms. You know, television in a way is is diminishing. You know, you got streaming platforms, you got digital platforms, obviously that are are, are really growing. And I think for a long time, the tendency was to, to the, the selective process was more towards generalists, people who, who could have, you know, be a jack of, of different trades with regard to the reporting. But I think it has become much like medicine did, you know, decades ago, it has become more specialized as well within journalism and, and health journalists, um, very, very strong appetite, infectious disease within health journalists, you know, very lots of desire. Even even outside of pandemic times, so I would recommend it, you know. And and to start, you know, just write as much as you can. Find areas that you're particularly interested in, uh, as a, as opposed to trying to be a generalist. Find what you're passionate about. Write a lot about it. If you're comfortable, post stuff, <laughs> because again, it's a flag to people out there that you're willing to talk about it and and you have an important message to share. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and just talk about. I know some of your own passions in well-being and in sort of living your best life. Uh, what are some of the things that you've done this last year to keep yourself going? <laughs> well, you know, I I have spent more time at home uh, throughout my entire married life than than ever before. I mean, I've been married seventeen years, and and I this this year, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a wanderlust guy, you know, and and so I've always been on the move. I've spent a lot of time at home and it's been wonderful. It's been, it's been great. I just never sort of saw myself being that sort of person. I, I'm mostly relegated to my basement to be fair, because I have this 10 by 10 space and that's where we built this little makeshift studio. But, um, but I've really, you know, uh, enjoyed being, being home with my family and doing things like taking walks. We'll try and take walks together and do things that we normally thought we would do only after we were retired we find ourselves doing now, um, you know, just, just spending a lot of time together. We obviously haven't gone out, but you know, the girls and I will have our spontaneous dance parties in the kitchen, you know, um, I don't know. We just, we've, we've had a chance to spend a lot of time together. And I think there's nothing good about this pandemic, but there's been some silver linings. And I think that's, that's maybe one of them. Someone said to me, uh, a while ago that there were sort of four personality types that were emerging from this pandemic. They were the hunk, the person who's working out all the time, the chunk, the person who's eating all the time, the drunk, the person who's drinking all the time, and the monk, the person who's, you know, gone into their meditative cocoon. And, I th and they said people have gone through some version of all these at some point or another. But for, for me, you know, just being so busy covering this pandemic, I've had a chance to really, you know, um, I think be reflective in a way that I hadn't before when you're always on the move, driving kids to every carpool thing and flying off to various places. So it's been a very, very different life for, for everybody, but that, those are some of the biggest differences for us. What are, what are some of the other silver linings, Sanjay? Um, you know, I think that the, the connections that I've had with even my own parents have been, has been good. You know, I think when we communicate now, we communicate on a, on a different level. Um, I think we were sort of falling into the, the pattern of having more, more perfunctory conversations. How are you doing? Doing fine. How are you doing? Doing fine. And it just was that. And, and this pandemic, because it, there was something that was always going on, the, the profoundness of our relationships, I think, uh, have changed. Um, but you know, I, I, I you know, I, I have looked at this overall. It's, it's hard for me, and I don't say this as an inherently pessimistic person, Preeti. I think you know me pretty well. But it's been a tough year. You know, it's, it's, it's still tough for me to, to look at silver linings. I, I, I've known too many people who have died. I've known too many people who are still sick. I know I talk to families all the time. One of my uncles in India just died. I mean, I just I feel like you're reeling all the time. So it is, it is, I think there'll be a time when I look back and I'll say, okay, this was a terrible period. Here were some of the silver linings, the resiliency maybe that, that people developed during this time, the preparedness for future pandemics, which I think everyone tells me is, is inevitable, frankly. You know, at some point there'll be another one. 
you know, that, that sort of learning and teaching. But I think we've just pay, paid a really, you know, a, a big price for these lessons this year. And, and um, you know, I think I, I always, I, I still very much think about lots of families that I was talking to on almost a daily basis early on in the pandemic whose loved one had died. And, you know, it was just, I think that, that just sticks with you. I think as a doctor, as a human, that's very, that, that's, that's, you know, a, a big part of me. Uh, you know, Sanjay, my condolences to your family. I saw that uh, about your uncle, and you know, I think um, the situation in India. If you know, we maybe we can just chat on that. Uh, early on in the pandemic, you know, Michigan, which is you know, both of us grew up, born here, raised here, had uh, been hit very hard. And you know, I don't know how that was for you to sort of watch that unfold. But you know, sort of watching what's happening in India right now, and you've spent a lot of time there uh, reporting. And uh, you know, visiting with family, and that uh, can you just talk about that? How that how that is for you to see that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been it's been really um, quite quite challenging. You know, I have a lot of family. I don't know if you do as well, but all of my family is in New Delhi. Most, in fact, most of our family, extended family, lives there, and we're you know we're really close. You know, we spend a um, <laughs> we have these long WhatsApp trails of conversations that everyone's weighing in on, and it's quite you know quite uh, endearing. Um, but this has been a tough time, Preeti. I, I, I think that what I would say is that I think for the most part this past year, um, they thought, you know, we're, we're being careful. Uh, and then in March of this year, they sort of heard that it was the end game. I think that was the exact quote that was that was made, you know, by the health commissioner. And they, you know, they were they took that to heart. And I think they thought this was the end game. And now they see what's unfolding in front of them, and they're scared. I mean, the 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 uh, uncle who who died. I mean, he. We don't know exactly when he was infected, but he essentially developed symptoms on a Tuesday and got, and he died by Thursday and was cremated on Friday. I mean, it was like it was like a trauma death. It was so sudden, you know. It was just, I mean, there were family members around the world who are still learning about this. You know, it was, it's it's jarring, and I'm not. I know there's millions of people who who've had this happen to them, but but it is jarring, you know, when it happens. So that part of it's been hard. The one thing I will say is that the, I think a question for a lot of people early on in the pandemic in India was, we are surprised it didn't get hit harder. You know, it's a very population dense area. If you look at um, the, the, the areas where you have some of the highest population density in the world, in some of these areas in Mumbai, why wasn't it hit harder? And there's all this speculation about various things, you know, uh, with pre-existing T-cell immunity, you know, primarily uh, uh, out, outdoor ventilation, multi-generational households, all these types of things. But what is not the case is that the virus is different, right? I think sometimes people look at, well, Michigan, I mean, they were doing everything right and they still got hit hard. You can't look at that and say, well, the virus must be behaving differently over there or everyone there is different somehow. That's not the case. You're missing something. Something happened. The virus is just the virus. It's just a little blob of genetic material. It has no, no, no free will, strategy, brain, anything. So what happened there? So you know, and I think it's the same thing in India. We don't know for sure why they were protected at the beginning. We have a, a decent idea of what's happening now in terms of large gatherings and more transmissible variants. But you know, it's it's um it's really heartbreaking. You know, less than two percent of the country right now is vaccinated. They're going to be at this a while. Yeah, you know, I'm just reflecting, Sanjay, on conversations that you and I had a year ago when India really hadn't had any cases or had very, very few cases and yeah. all that speculation. And I think it, you know, unfortunately, it's a cautionary tale. Uh, so looking ahead, what do you think the role of media is going to be in the next year regarding uh, COVID communication and, and just really trying to keep up with, with whatever it is that it, this looks like? I, th I think you know media will continue to have a, a an important role, and and despite what I had said earlier about people going to their wanting to hear about vaccine hesitancy specifically from their own their own doctors, their own healthcare professionals, there has been you know a significant significant um, desire for for COVID stories, knowledge, information you know via media. We 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 just know by looking at people's interest and in things you know. Uh, so I think that that will continue. I mean th there. I think the story and, and what has happened here does change to some extent and, and, and some of it in a very good way. I mean, I'm optimistic like, like you are about, you know, the next few months and, 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 you know, at least uh, achieving some 
some level of community immunity between natural infection and vaccinations and, and the, the warmer, more humid weather. But I think going into the fall, I think uh, media will have an important role in terms of what happens as everyone goes back to school, colleges, University of Michigan, places like that, and just how does that all unfold? But I also think the two other things, Preeti, that are, are really important, we have not fully, from a mental health standpoint, I think fully process what has just happened here. I said this, I had this conversation with my 15 year old the other day, Sage, and I just said, this is not normal, what has happened here. 600,000 people dying of a disease we did not even know about, you know, or hadn't defined 15 months ago is not normal. You know, that, that's, it shouldn't just be, that that's just the expectation of the world that this, that this will happen over and over again. We can do things to be prepared to you know, empower ourselves to be better prepared. And I think it's really important just from a mental health standpoint. So it doesn't feel like these things are preordained and you're helpless. But I also think, you know, just when you, when you look at the long hauling symptoms that people are developing, these numbers, if they're true, and we're still all learning, there will be entire hospitals, maybe even hospital systems dedicated to taking care of post COVID. I mean, it is that significant when I talk to the researchers at Sinai in terms of what they're seeing the types of uh, care that patients are still needing nine, 10 months after their diagnosis. So, you know, hopefully these patients, it's not chronic, chronic disease and people do improve. We, we just don't know yet. We'll learn at the passage of time. But I think beyond the obvious news stories that will continue to be told around this, the largest public health sort of, you know, issue of our, our generation, there will be these follow-up things that will have a, a more lasting impact on society, which people are going to want to continue to learn about. Yeah, you know, two things I say a lot are COVID is not the only risk to our health. And I, I think a lot about loneliness, social isolation, older adults, younger adults. And uh, the the um, focus has, has been on hospitalizations and deaths, but the cost of COVID is so much more than that. You know, all the aspects of well-being, economic, financial, academic, you know, I, I worry a lot about the academic piece too, like what what, yeah. what people have missed out on. So, I you know, I, it may it may be in the rear view mirror, but I, I think it's still going to be there for a long, long time. Yeah, I I, I I totally agree. I will say on a on a on a optimistic note, you know, you and I both know Howard Markell. Um, maybe he's even listening because he listens to these things quite religiously. But he he you know he's a historian and he goes back and looks at the longer term impact of things, including 1918 flu pandemic. And the, all these questions I think are really relevant and important questions to ask. But you know, we also do have some historical precedent that there was a you know, fairly rapid return, an earnest return at least to, to normalcy, you know, the, the roaring 20s, which followed the 1918-1919 flu pandemic. It's not across the board and like most things in life, it wasn't shared equitably, but but there was this desire to have this this return, and and even if you follow kids out decades after that time period, was this more of an interruption to their lives or a derailment? It seemed more like an interruption, um, you know. So we'll see. We'll see if that that happens this time around, or what the longer term impacts are going to be. But there's a little bit of cause for optimism. Yeah, I I am optimistic. I I, I worry about you know what's going to happen between now and sort of that next phase, but. There's a question that came in. I just wanted to uh, ask it to you. Uh, how can uh, Americans advocate for vaccine distribution to areas of the world that need them, such as India? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, it, it's it's a really important question. And, and, you know, the United States, as the questioner may know, other people may know, does uh, help fund uh, programs such as COVAX, which does, you know, distribute vaccines around the world. There's been all this discussion just over the last few days about lifting some of the intellectual property protections around vaccines to make them, at least the IP behind these vaccines, uh, more readily available. And then even distributing some of the pre-purchased vaccines that were that were purchased here in the United States, like the AstraZeneca vaccine, which they pre-purchased but has not been authorized here. Some of that may be distributed. If the question is what is the obligation, I, I think you know there is a, a very practical obligation, which is that you know I think this pandemic has reminded us, um, not taught us because we already knew, but reminded us that outbreaks anywhere can be outbreaks everywhere. We kind of have have known this, and if India is continuing to have significant spread, um, that's a problem for the world. 
it, it really is. If for no other reason, you may inspire more mutations. Some of these mutations may develop um, uh, escape immunity from the vaccines and, and you know, cause issues all, all over the world. So there's that practical reason. I think there's obviously the humanitarian tug. I mean, I'm telling you, you know, these images and you, you, you look at this and you say, we live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. This is a pandemic. We are all in this together. Let's, let's define what that means. If there's no other time in our lives, in our history, do we have an opportunity to define what that means? We are all in this together. And here's one of them. So I think that there's, there's that part of it as, as well. So, you know, I mean, I, I, how do you decide? Like if, if you said we live in a total, I want to live in a totally equitable world, you'd say, well, the vulnerable people in every country get the vaccine first, 65 in order to get the vaccine first. That obviously did not happen. Um, and someone likened it to me as, as a metaphor, which is a metaphor you've heard, which is the oxygen mask drop on a plane. You always put yours on first so that you can then better help the people around you. And, you know, maybe that's sort of the, if you had to sort of describe from a metaphorical standpoint, the foreign policy approach of vaccine distribution by the United States, that would kind of be maybe it, where we, we need to vaccinate, you know, uh, take care of our country, then we can better take care of the rest of the world, perhaps, maybe it's not a metaphor that holds up exactly. But I think there is that fine balance. Right now, you got someone being vaccinated every second in high income countries, 81% of the vaccines have gone to high income countries and 0.3% have gone to low-income countries. That obviously is the other extreme. That's the opposite of equity around the world. So there's a happy medium in there. So my last question to you, Sanjay, is uh, what do you miss most about Ann Arbor? <laughs> uh, I, 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 Ann Arbor is my favorite town. I, I still, to this day, having lived in so many places and around the country and visited so many places around the world, I um, I love the food. I love the 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 uh, the sports. I love, I just love the, the, um, the atmosphere in the sense that I, when I'm, when I'm there, I feel like I'm surrounded by people who are just curious about the world. And, you know, um, I, I love being in an academic town, but I miss it. I really, I, 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 I miss it a lot. So I'm well, jealous of you. you. <laughs> I got to so, say that I, I didn't wear my Michigan tie today, but I, but my, Rebecca just put this in front of me. I do have my, maybe you see that my IHPI socks. Nice. Which I wear very <laughs> proudly. Uh, you know, it's like that old thing. Like I did this talk and all I got was a t-shirt. Well, I have these socks, which I'm very proud of. I'm very proud of. No, that's, that's great. You know, Sanjay, this has been such a fun conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for everything you do. You and Rebecca, your support of IHPI, Michigan Medicine, the university. And, you know, it's not too early to start making plans for uh, college visits with, uh, with Sage. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm hoping we at least get two of the three. Uh, so I hope uh, to see you in Ann Arbor soon. And I'm going to turn it back to John to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay and Preeti, for a very engaging conversation. And, and Sanjay, for your shout out to our IHPI Socks, one of our <laughs> highest honors. Uh, I want to thank all of you watching and listening for joining us today. I invite you to visit the IHPI website at ihpi.umich.edu. Follow us on Twitter at um underscore IHPI and sign up for our monthly newsletter, IHPI Informs, to learn more about our work to improve the quality, safety, equity, and affordability of healthcare. We wish you all the best and go blue.